this. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the SUNY National Distance Learning Week webinar series. We're thrilled that you've joined us this afternoon. Uh, if you could take a moment, let us know where you are tuning in from in the chat. That would be great. I do see some familiar names from other webinars this week, so thanks for coming back. Um, microphones are muted during the presentation, but feel free to put any questions for Andrea in the chat, and I'll field those to her, and also there'll be some time at the end for questions, and we'll open up the mics at that point if you prefer to talk that way. Um, National Distance Learning Week is something that's celebrated annually to generate a greater awareness and appreciation of distance learning while recognizing leaders like Andrea and best practices in the field. So at Open SUNY, we hope to showcase the expertise of professionals who are engaged in this day-to-day -day practice of distance learning. My name is Erin Maney. I am the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement here at Open SUNY. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you to this showcase webinar. Today, we are pleased to host Andrea uh, Nickisher from Buffalo State College, who will be sharing her experience in teaching sensitive topics online. Andrea is an associate professor and the program coordinator for the adult education program at SUNY Buffalo State. She has 20 years of experience as an adult educator providing crisis intervention and violence prevention workshops to schools, businesses, and community groups. And she has taught 100% online for the past eight years. She is also an Open SUNY Fellow. Her recent scholarship focuses on the impact of trauma on education and career. So on behalf of the Open SUNY team, Andrea, thank you for joining us today and sharing what you know. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Erin. And thank you to everyone who's taking time out of their day to have this conversation. I'm so excited to be here. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to share them in the chat. I can't see the chat, but Erin can alert me to the questions and I'm happy to answer them as we go through. So um, today I just want to talk a little bit about one of what I think is the biggest challenges to teaching online, and that is teaching sensitive topics and addressing either controversy or distress within an online setting. So today we're going to talk about what sensitive topics are um, and really how I set up my course and approach teaching sensitive topics online. So with that, let's talk about sensitive topics. Um, a sensitive topic is a topic that is either potentially distressing, such as a topic about sexual violence or child abuse or another traumatic topic or it's a topic that is potentially controversial. And this is really important if that topic in some way feels personal. Um, and I would say one of the biggest differences I've noticed since 2016 is the really um, uh, explosive nature of anything political. In the adult education field, we really approach a lot of quote unquote sensitive topics and certainly policy issues are important in education discussions. Um, so thinking through the issues related to sensitive topics is really important for my field. Um, to summarize, any topic that can inspire an emotional response from a student or to which a student feels a strong personal connection could be a sensitive topic. Um, I'm sure there's lots of examples of topics that are really not traditionally considered sensitive that could actually inspire an emotional response in a student. Um, and that's something to consider uh, when we think through the issues related to sensitive topics. In a bit, I'll talk about trauma triggers and trigger warnings, and we'll think through uh, what can be triggering a bit further. Um, but the first thing I do before I teach any course where I think there is material that could be considered potentially distressing or in some way stressful or really emotional for a student is to make sure I know all of my campus resources. I actually work really closely with the campus safety team. I'm on the College Senate. I'm the chair of the Graduate Advisory Council. So I know a lot about what's going on on campus. This is critically important. Um, 
to be able to serve students, particularly students who may be experiencing symptoms of trauma or distress, you have to know what resources are available on your particular campus. Um, so my sort of three uh, go-to campus resources are the Title IX office. Here at SUNY Buffalo State, they're gonna handle any complaint, concern, or report about sexual violence or domestic violence. A lot of faculty aren't really aware of the responsibility they have to report um, sexual and domestic violence to their campus, um, but faculty are considered mandated campus reporters. If I get a disclosure, and I actually get many disclosures every year, um, I go right to uh, the Dean of Students here at Buffalo State and I talk to her about the process for reporting. Um, most of my disclosures are from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so we have a conversation just to um, know what's best for the student anonymously. Um, but certainly if you have a report about a current um, situation, you're going to have to make a formal report to your Title IX office or to whatever office handles those complaints on your campus. Um, here at Buffalo State, we have a campus care team. So if a student is in distress, is indicating any sort of um, uh, serious stress or depression or concerns about suicide or suicide ideation, uh, we have a team on campus that will respond to that student. Um, I've called our campus care team many times for students experiencing distress. Um, it is a wonderful resource on campus. It certainly does not replace 911 if you are having a serious emergency. Um, but if you have a student who you have general concerns about, the campus care team is a wonderful resource. Um, so make sure you find out on your campus who um, you can call or you can email when you have students in distress. And then last but not least, of course, you need to know what services your counseling center offers. Um, because we are teaching online, um, we obviously don't just want to know what campus resources are available. We also have to find out what additional resources are important for students to have. Um, and in my courses, if I'm teaching the course on family and sexual violence, I'm going to have all of those all of those resources embedded in the course from day one. Um, I put up on the screen two resources I use in my classes. One is a New York State um, domestic violence hotline. It is 24 hours a day. Any student can call uh, with a concern about domestic or sexual violence. And I also include the web link for crisis services. Um, here in Erie County, um, crisis services has a 24 hour hotline for suicide, for domestic violence, sexual assault, and any other mental health crisis. Um, even if our students who we're teaching online are located close to the campus or in our local community, they may not want to access campus resources. When it comes to issues like sexual assault, domestic violence, and other forms of trauma, students often prefer to seek help from outside of campus due to um, really confidentiality concerns. So I like to give those wonderful campus resources in addition to those outside resources. And I would do that in both a face-to-face -face and an online course. So we talked before about what a sensitive topic is, really any topic that can elicit a personal emotional response that could potentially trigger distress that is really controversial in some way. Um, and some of our class topics can actually trigger um, trauma and symptoms of previous trauma. So I wanted to just give you some information about trauma triggers. A trauma trigger is a sight, sound, or smell that conjures up an emotional reaction to a past 
traumatic event. A trauma trigger can set off symptoms of PTSD, um, including intrusive memories, hypersensitivity, anxiety, etc. Um, one thing that's really important to know about trauma triggers is that they are very individual. So for certain course content, um, sexual violence, domestic violence, child abuse, we know that content can be triggering because of the nature of the content. But there are lots of other ways that trauma can be triggered, which um, are very individual to the person. Um, so there might be content in one of our courses that we would have no idea would be triggering to someone, that that might trigger a trauma response. Again, for me, that is why it's so important to have those campus and community resources available for all my students, even in courses that are not considered sensitive topics. Um, so trigger warnings. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about trigger warnings. You may have read some of the academic debate about trigger warnings. I am a very big fan of trigger and content warnings. I use them throughout my courses on um, sexual and domestic violence and on diversity issues, but I also use them in other courses as appropriate. Um, for me, it is an issue of universal design and just preparing students for the content that's going to be coming up in the course. Um, it's really about creating a safe space. And the scholars who fa favor trigger warnings really talk about this safe space, um, the importance of spa safe space and the way that informing students in advance of content can help to build safe space in either your face-to-face -face or your online course. Um, from my perspective, it's even more important in an online course because you may not be there online with the students when they're logging on to see content for the first time as you would be in a face-to-face -face course. Um, so giving that warning in advance really helps them to know what's coming in your Blackboard course. Um, it just prepares your audience and again, I think it's a form of universal de design, and as such, it really benefits all students. So I wanna talk a little bit about how I set up the assignments in my courses where I know the content could be triggering trauma, could be distressful to students, could be in some way eliciting a strong emotional response. And one thing that I really advocate, advocate for is um, thinking through your course readings. Um, so first things first, you should carefully review your course readings to make sure there's nothing gratuitous in terms of trauma, in terms of distressful topics. If you are teaching a topic completely unrelated to sexual assault, you may not want to include a reading on sexual assault. It is always about asking the question, does this enhance my content? If it does, you should absolutely leave it in I am a strong believer in academic freedom and you need to decide what is best in your course. But if there's a reading that has gratuitous sexual violence, child abuse, domestic violence, you may wanna consider uh, whether or not it, it is important to have that reading in your class. I actually teach about those topics, so I have to cover them, um, but I'm very careful about the materials that I include. Um, for example, in my family violence course, I have my students read a book about a woman who was sexually assaulted in college and her journey afterwards. Um, but there is one chapter in the book that describes the sexual assault in great detail. I tell my students they don't need to read that chapter. So um, I send out that uh, trigger warning and also that option to skip a chapter 
very early uh, before the course even opens in case anyone wants to skip ahead. I made a determination the chapter doesn't add to what we're learning. So if a student wants to read it, they can, but it really is a matter of student choice. Um, and of course, I put those trigger warnings in everywhere. So if there are readings that are going to be emotional, that are going to be potentially distressing, I put the trigger warnings in the syllabus. They're also embedded in the Blackboard course in my modules. And for me, that's a really important way to make sure that the student is getting the message. Um, we do have a lot of students who like to skip ahead in their reading. And um, I think it's important that we prepare them in advance by making sure on our reading list, we have those trigger warnings listed. Um, very important point about alternative readings. When I offer a variety of different articles or an alternative article or the ability to skip a chapter, I do this for every student in the class. No student needs to come to me to make a special request to do an alternative reading, um, and no student needs to inform me in advance. Um, those alternative readings are available for everyone. They don't need permission. We don't need to have a conversation about it. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for students to protect themselves and take care of themselves in our courses. Um, so it's really important to just be a universal design ideas, have those readings available to all students from the very beginning. Um, and I do a similar thing with assignments. And you know, uh, I'm in adult education and I can tell you, having assignment options, having reading options, that's just good adult education. That's an adult education best practice, as well as being a best practice for sensitive topics. Um, but I really think it's useful in a course where you know the content may be triggering, such as a course on family violence, even a diversity course where we're talking about issues related to transgender rights or other uh, very emotional issues such as police violence. I like to give students lots of options for how they will be assessed in that course. So I'd like to share with you one example from my family violence course. For that major final project in the course, I allow students three different options. They can do a research paper on a specific topic that they want to know more about. They can create a detailed lesson plan or a family violence uh, protocol for a corporation, a hypothetical uh, or real uh, protocol, depending where they work. Um, or they can participate in a service learning experience in their local community. Um, I find that giving these options really empowers students to work with content they are comfortable with. Um, so they are learning more, they are meeting the goals of the course, um, but they're able to do so in a way that fits with their needs um, and that they are able to work in a way where they're avoiding um, needless stress or distress with these very sensitive topics. So let's talk about the Blackboard course. I've given you an idea of what I consider a sensitive course or sensitive material. I've told you that I start by looking for those campus and outside resources. Then I think through both my readings and my assessments, and then I begin to build that Blackboard course. Um, so here at Buffalo State, we have a link that auto uh, builds into our Blackboard courses, which is a student resources link. I'm guessing many of you have the same link come up in your Blackboard shell when you begin to build a new Blackboard course. I make sure I leave that link in there on the left-hand navigation bar. Um, it does include the Counseling Center phone number um, and other resources on campus that are really important for students. So um, for me, it's really important to keep that link front and center in my Blackboard course. 
Additionally, in that left-hand navigation bar, I make other stable links. So the crisis services link, I'm gonna put there the New York State Domestic Violence Hotline when we're dealing with domestic or sexual violence content. Um, and I'm gonna put other campus resources in that left-hand navigation bar um, so that it's really easy for students to access. Um, if a student is in distress and they are in the course, I don't want them to have to go far uh, to find those numbers that they need to call or that website they need to go to for help. Um, additionally, in all my Blackboard courses, I have an Ask the Instructor discussion board and I have a send email function so emails can come directly to me and I can respond as quickly as possible to any student concerns. Um, and then in addition to having those links on the left-hand navigation bar, I build in those trigger and content warnings. Um, they don't have to be complicated. Uh, if you are in a course and there's gonna be an article on sexual violence and it's not really what the whole course is about, but you wanna keep it included, um, you can simply put a note saying, this article is going to discuss sexual violence. If you would rather read an alternative article, it is here. If you don't have an alternative reading, then you can just remind that those uh, additional resource links are in the left-hand navigation bar. Um, but it's really important in the Blackboard course to build all of those things in so that students know where to get help and also that they're prepared for what's coming up if they may have forgotten what's in the syllabus. They never do that. Sometimes, sometimes they might forget. Um, so for me, I love to have student-to-student -student interaction and instructor-to-student interaction. And one way I do that is through discussion boards. When we are talking about sensitive and controversial topics, having discussions is really important and really, really meaningful. Um, discussion boards are an awesome way to have student-to-student -student interaction in your course. But when we're talking about sensitive and controversial topics, um, we need to take a little more care with how we facilitate those discussions. Um, so first, I begin by really preparing carefully crafted, structured guiding discussion questions. Um, for me, it's important to embed all of those discussions in the course readings. Um, while there is a space for some opinion, um, when we're dealing with sensitive topics, controversial topics, politics, um, staying within the confines of, of the course readings really helps um, to keep the discussion focused. Um, I keep my discussion periods very short, 48 to 72 hours. Um, and the reason I do that is one, it makes sure that students are more likely to be online all at the same time. Um, but two, it makes it easier for me to keep control of the discussion. Um, I don't micromanage discussions, but I need to read everything that's happening so I can respond if there is anyone who's used language that's offensive or inappropriate. A lot of times students aren't aware that what they're saying might offend someone else. So I wanna be able to quickly have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that student um, and talk about perhaps editing the post. Um, or if there's uh, a heated discussion happening, I might want to step in um, and sort of help guide the discussion to a healthier place. Having a short discussion period makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, and I'm a big fan of structure. So I have for my discussions structured first posts and then a structured follow-up discussion from me, and then nurturing uh, challenges coming from peers. Um, but I have to be there uh, really, really engaged and active in discussions, particularly when the topic could be traumatic, distressful, or um, controversial in some way. 
Um, I personally strongly recommend that discussion first posts are due before the follow-up discussion begins. For example, in my diversity course, I have first posts due at 1 p.m. and then I review all the first posts, craft my follow-up discussion questions, and start the follow-up discussion at 2 p.m. So on Monday at 1 p.m., they post their first posts. I review them to make sure everyone's moving in a positive, healthy direction. And then I craft or tweak my follow-up questions and the follow-up discussion begins at two. Um, the reason I do that is I have time to review that first set of lengthy posts um, to make sure everyone's moving in a, in a good way, the discussion forward. Um, and I can catch anything early if there are any problematic posts in that first round. I know I'm talking a lot about problematic posts. The truth is I rarely, if ever, have any problems in a specific course, um, but you have to be prepared for it. Uh, additionally, a lot of times uh, after I review those first posts, I'll think of some great questions I hadn't thought of before, and the students will really inspire me to help move the discussion in a better direction. Um, I have students sign a course contract at the beginning of my course. They take a syllabus review quiz. At the end of their syllabus review quiz, they sign off on knowing where all the campus resources are, and then they sign off on those general rules of respect that we have and expect in our discussion boards. And they also are encouraged to use nurturing challenges. Just because a topic is sensitive or controversial does not mean we don't want to get into it. Um, my students are graduate students and I expect them to do the hard analytical work uh, with their readings and to really challenge themselves. The goal in all of my courses is transformation and transformative learning. Um, so you have to allow a space for it to get a little bit messy. Um, we just don't want the space to get out of control or to get um, harmful in some way. So as, as the instructor, I'm, I'm balancing that throughout that discussion period. Um, but ultimately, we want to empower our students to do the heavy lifting to move the discussion forward. So we're putting that structure there, um, but we're encouraging uh, our students to be the leaders in that discussion. And then if you've ever heard me talk about my Blackboard courses in any setting, you will know that I am obsessed with personal journals. I think they are uh, an awesome tool. I absolutely love personal journals. I use them in every single one of my Blackboard courses, even my research methods course. Um, they are an awesome way for students to talk directly to me in a safe and private space. Um, and so I have weekly one-on-one -on -one interaction with my students through personal journals. Um, in a course with a sensitive topic or when we are talking about a sensitive topic in a sort of a course that isn't generally sensitive, um, I like to use journals to get a little deeper into personal experiences of students or to give them the option to dig a little deeper. Um, I really structure my questions for the journals as I do for my discussion boards. Um, it can't just be a free write. I, I have questions that I've created to really promote critical reflection um, and to tie our readings to practice and personal experience. Um, but even though I have those really structured questions, in the journal, I dispense of grammar rules, I dispense of all my strict APA formatting, I can accept song lyrics. Um, I really allow students to express themselves in a variety of ways, as long as they're focused on those guiding questions that I've posted uh, for them to work on in their journal. Most importantly, you have to give students a space to ask questions of you 
on those boards. Um, really, in, in all of my courses, students ask me a lot of questions about both their own experiences, their own career traje trajectory, as well as um, questions about content that they are embarrassed to ask, perhaps in front of the whole class. Or, you know, in a diversity class, for example, I have students who are afraid of offending other students with their questions. Um, so the personal journal space allows us to have a conversation about the readings, about questions they may have, about their own experiences that is um, safe uh, and really a one-on-one -on -one space. Um, I grade very generously personal journals. I really grade on a complete, incomplete basis. I'm not comfortable assuming that I know the quality of one's reflection. If the student has followed the guidelines and um, met the requirements for the journal, then um, they get a complete grade on that. And that is my recommendation. Um, personally, I do make them turn it in on time. Um, so I might deduct points for word count or for it being late. But beyond that, I'm gonna be very generous in my scoring of the journals. Andrea, I know how important your last slide is, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that we're just about time. Okay, great. So, well, I'm, I'm yep. just gonna kind of refer everyone out. Um, sure. One thing we don't talk about enough, I think, in higher ed is our own self-care, particularly when we're talking about sensitive or difficult or distressing topics. Um, so I recently published an article, if you're interested, um, but my last words, I just wanna say, don't just take care of your students, make sure you're also taking care of yourself. Thank you so much, everyone. Absolutely, that's super important. And you've um, you've had some comments, you know, people in agreement great. with you in the chat. And oh, great. I uh, can't also see the chat. Uh, one who definitely appreciated the alternative uh, assignments and, and how to do the trigger warnings. So that's always really great. great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Feel free to email me with any questions. I'm at SUNY Buffalo State. And thank you to everyone for joining us again for another wonderful National Distance Learning Week session. We did record this and we will be making all of the recordings available here on this URL that I'll post in the chat. So that should be there by the end of the day. So again, I wanna thank our speaker, Andrea, and I wanna thank you all for your attendance and participation. Have a great day. Thanks everyone, bye.